Section 6 From a long way off, one could distinguish and identify the steeple of Saint-Hilaire, inscribing its unforgettable form upon a horizon, beneath which Combray had not yet appeared. When from the train which brought us down from Paris at Easter time, my father caught sight of it, as it slipped into every fold of the sky in turn, its little iron cock, veering continually in all directions, he would say, Come, get your wraps together, we are there. And on one of the longest walks we ever took from Combray, there was a spot where the narrow road emerged suddenly onto an immense plain, closed at the horizon by strips of forest over which rose and stood alone the fine point of St. Hilaire's steeple, but so sharpened and so pink that it seemed to be no more than sketched on the sky by the fingernail of a painter anxious to give to such a landscape, to so pure a piece of nature, this little sign of art, this single indication of human existence. As one drew near it, and could make out the remains of the square tower, half in ruins, which still stood by its side, though without rivalling it in height, one was struck, first of all, by the tone, reddish and sombre, of its stones, and on a misty morning in autumn, one would have called it, to see it rising above the violet thundercloud of the vineyards, a ruin of purple, almost the colour of the wild vine. Often in the square, as we came home, my grandmother would make me stop to look up at it. From the tower windows, placed two and two, one pair above another, with that right and original proportion in their spacing, to which not only human faces owe their beauty and dignity, it released, it let fall at regular intervals, flights of jackdaws, which for a little while would wheel and caw, as though the ancient stones which allowed them to sport thus, and never seemed to see them, becoming of a sudden uninhabitable, and discharging some infinitely disturbing element, had struck them, and driven them forth. Then, after patterning everywhere the violet velvet of the evening air, abruptly soothed, they would return and be absorbed in the tower, deadly no longer, but benignant, some perching here and there, not seeming to move, but snapping, perhaps, and swallowing some passing insect, on the points of turrets, as a seagull perches, with an angler's immobility, on the crest of a wave. Without quite knowing why, my grandmother found in the steeple of St. Hilaire that absence of vulgarity, pretension, and meanness, which made her love, and deem rich in beneficent influences, nature itself, when the hand of man had not, as did my great-aunt's gardener, trimmed it, and the works of genius. And certainly every part one saw of the church served to distinguish the whole from any other building by a kind of general feeling which pervaded it. But it was in the steeple that the church seemed to display a consciousness of itself, to affirm its individual and responsible existence. It was the steeple which spoke for the church. I think, too, that in a confused way my grandmother found in the steeple of Combray what she prized above anything else in the world, namely a natural air and an air of distinction. Ignorant of architecture, she would say, My dears, laugh at me if you like. It is not conventionally beautiful, but there is something in its quaint old face which pleases me. If it could play the piano, I am sure it would really play. And when she gazed on it, when her eyes followed the gentle tension, the fervent inclination of its stony slopes, which drew together as they rose, like hands joined in prayer, she would absorb herself so utterly in the outpouring of the spire, that her gaze seemed to leap upwards with it, 
her lips at the same time curving in a friendly smile for the worn old stones of which the setting sun now illumined no more than the topmost pinnacles, which, at the point where they entered that zone of sunlight, and were softened and sweetened by it, seemed to have mounted suddenly far higher, to have become truly remote, like a song whose singer breaks into falsetto, an octave above the accompanying air. It was the steeple of St. Hilaire, which shaped and crowned and consecrated every occupation, every hour of the day, every point of view in the town. From my bedroom window I could discern no more than its base, which had been freshly covered with slates. But when on Sundays I saw these, in the hot light of a summer morning, blaze like a black sun, I would say to myself, "'Good heavens! Nine o'clock! I must get ready for mass at once, if I am to have time to go in and kiss Aunt Leonie first. And I would know exactly what was the colour of the sunlight upon the square. I could feel the heat and dust of the market, the shade behind the blinds of the shop, into which Mamma would perhaps go on her way to mass, penetrating its odour of unbleached calico, to purchase a handkerchief or something.' of which the draper himself would let us see what he had, bowing from the waist, who, having made everything ready for shutting up, had just gone into the back shop to put on his Sunday coat and to wash his hands, which was his habit, every few minutes, and even on the saddest occasions, to rub one against the other with an air of enterprise, cunning, and success. And again, after mass, when we looked in to tell Theodore to bring a larger loaf than usual, because our cousins had taken advantage of the fine weather to come over from Thibasy for luncheon, we had in front of us the steeple, which, baked and brown itself, like a larger loaf still of holy bread, with flakes and sticky drops on it of sunlight, pricked its sharp point into the blue sky. And in the evening, as I came in from my walk, and thought of the approaching moment when I must say good-night to my mother, and see her no more. The steeple was by contrast so kindly, there at the close of day, that I would imagine it as being laid, like a brown velvet cushion, against, as being thrust into the pallid sky which had yielded beneath its pressure, had sunk slightly so as to make room for it, and had correspondingly risen on either side, while the cries of the birds wheeling to and fro about it seemed to intensify its silence, to elongate its spire still further, and to invest it with some quality beyond the power of words. Even when our errands lay in places behind the church, from which it could not be seen, the view seemed always to have been composed with reference to the steeple, which would stand up now here, now there, among the houses, and was perhaps even more affecting when it appeared thus without the church. And, indeed, there are many others which look best when seen in this way, and I can call to mind vignettes of housetops with surmounting steeples in quite another category of art than those formed by the dreary streets of Combray. I shall never forget in a quaint Norman town not far from Baalbek, two charming eighteenth-century houses, dear to me and venerable for many reasons, between which, when one looks up at them from a fine garden which descends in terraces to the river, the Gothic spire of a church, itself hidden by the houses, soars into the sky with the effect of crowning and completing their fronts but in a material so different, so precious, so beringed, so rosy, so polished, that it is at once seen to be no more a part of them than would be a part of two pretty pebbles lying side by side, between which it had been washed on the beach, the purple, crinkled spire of some seashell spun out into a turret and gay with glossy colour even in Paris, in one of the ugliest parts of the town, I know a window from which one can see across a first, a second, and even a third layer of jumbled roofs, 
street beyond street, a violet bell, sometimes ruddy, sometimes too, in the finest prints which the atmosphere makes of it, of an ashy solution of black, which is, in fact, nothing else than the dome of St. Augustine, and which imparts to this view of Paris the character of some of the Piranesi views of Rome. But since into none of these little etchings, whatever the taste my memory may have been able to bring to their execution, was it able to contribute an element I have long lost, the feeling which makes us not merely regard a thing as a spectacle, but believe in it as in a creature without parallel, so none of them keeps in dependence on it a whole section of my inmost life as does the memory of those aspects of the steeple of Combray from the streets behind the church. Whether one saw it at five o'clock when going to call for letters at the post office, some doors away from one, on the left, raising abruptly with its isolated peak the ridge of housetops, or again, when one had to go in and ask for news of Madame Sazerat, one's eyes followed the line where it ran low again beyond the father, descending slope, and one knew that it would be the second turning after the steeple, or yet again, if pressing further afield one went to the station, one saw it obliquely, showing in profile fresh angles and surfaces, like a solid body surprised at some unknown point in its revolution, or, from the banks of the Vivonne, the apse, drawn muscularly together and heightened in perspective, seemed to spring upwards with the effort which the steeple made to hurl its spire-point into the heart of heaven. It was always to the steeple that one must return, always it which dominated everything else, summing up the houses with an unexpected pinnacle, raised before me like the finger of God, whose body might have been concealed below among the crowd of human bodies, without fear of my confounding it, for that reason, with them. And so even today, in any large provincial town, or in a quarter of Paris which I do not know well, if a passer-by who is putting me on the right road, shows me from afar, as a point to aim at, some belfry of a hospital, or a convent steeple lifting the peak of its ecclesiastical cap at the corner of the street which I am to take, my memory need only find in it some dim resemblance to that dear and vanished outline. And the passer-by, should he turn round to make sure that I have not gone astray, would see me, to his astonishment, oblivious of the walk that I had planned to take, or the place where I was obliged to call, standing still on the spot, before that steeple, for hours on end, motionless, trying to remember, feeling deep within myself a tract of soil reclaimed from the waters of Lethe, slowly drying, until the buildings rise on it again. And then no doubt, and then more uneasily than when, just now, I asked him for a direction, I will seek my way again. I will turn a corner. But the goal is in my heart. On our way home from Mass, we would often meet Monsieur Le Grandin, who, detained in Paris by his professional duties as an engineer, could only, except in the regular holiday seasons, visit his home at Combray between Saturday evenings and Monday mornings. He was one of that class of men who, apart from a scientific career in which they may well have proved brilliantly successful, have acquired an entirely different kind of culture, literary or artistic, of which they make no use in the specialised work of their profession, but by which their conversation profits, more literary than many men of letters. We were not aware at this period that Monsieur Le Grandin had a distinct reputation as a writer, and so were greatly astonished to find that a well-known composer had set some verses of his to music. Endowed with a greater ease in execution than many painters, they imagine that the life they are obliged to lead is not that for which they are really fitted, and they bring to their regular occupations either a fantastic indifference 
or a sustained and lofty application, scornful, bitter, and conscientious. Tall, with a good figure, a fine, thoughtful face, drooping fair moustaches, a look of disillusionment in his blue eyes, an almost exaggerated refinement of courtesy, a talker such as we had never heard. He was, in the sight of my family, who never ceased to quote him as an example, the very pattern of a gentleman, who took life in the noblest and most delicate manner. My grandmother alone found fault with him, for speaking a little too well, a little too much like a book, for not using a vocabulary as natural as his loosely knotted Lavalier neckties, his short, straight, almost schoolboyish coat. She was astonished, too, at the furious invective which he was always launching at the aristocracy, at fashionable life, and snobbishness. Undoubtedly, he would say, the sin of which St. Paul is thinking, when he speaks of the sin for which there is no forgiveness. Worldly ambition was a thing which my grandmother was so little capable of feeling, or indeed of understanding, that it seemed to her futile to apply so much heat to its condemnation. Besides, she thought it in not very good taste that Monsieur Le Grandin, whose sister was married to a country gentleman of Lower Normandy near Balbec, should deliver himself of such violent attacks upon the nobles, going so far as to blame the revolution for not having guillotined them all. "'Well met, my friends,' he would say as he came towards us. "'You are lucky to spend so much time here. "'Tomorrow I have to go back to Paris, to squeeze back into my niche.' "'Oh, I admit,' he went on, with his own peculiar smile, "'gently ironical, disillusioned, and vague. "'I have every useless thing in the world in my house there. "'The only thing wanting is the necessary thing, "'a great patch of open sky like this.' Always try to keep a patch of sky above your life, little boy, he added, turning to me. You have a soul in you of rare quality, an artist's nature. Never let it starve for lack of what it needs. When, on our reaching the house, my aunt would send to ask us whether Madame Goupil had indeed arrived late for mass, not one of us could inform her. Instead, we increased her anxiety by telling her that there was a painter at work in the church copying the window of Gilbert the Bad. Francoise was at once dispatched to the grocer's, but returned empty-handed, owing to the absence of Theodore, whose dual profession of choirman, with a part in the maintenance of the fabric, and of grocer's assistant, gave him not only relations with all sections of society, but an encyclopedic knowledge of their affairs. Ah, my aunt would sigh. I wish it were time for Eulalie to come. She is really the only person who will be able to tell me. Eulalie was a limping, energetic, deaf spinster, who had retired after the death of Madame de la Bretonnerie, with whom she had been in service from her childhood, and had then taken a room beside the church, from which she would incessantly emerge, either to attend some service, or when there was no service, to say a prayer by herself or to give Theodore a hand. The rest of her time she spent in visiting sick persons like my Aunt Leonie, to whom she would relate everything that had occurred at Mass or Vespers. She was not above adding occasional pocket money to the little income which was found for her by the family of her old employers, by going from time to time to look after the curie's linen, or that of some other person of note in the clerical world of Combray. Above a mantle of black cloth, she wore a little white coif that seemed almost to attach her to some order, and an infirmity of the skin had stained part of her cheeks and her crooked nose the bright red colour of balsam. Her visits were the one great distraction in the life of my Aunt Leonie, who now saw hardly any one else, except the Reverend Curie. My aunt had by degrees erased every other visitor's name from her list, because they all committed the fatal error, in her eyes, of falling into one or other of the two categories of people she most detested. One group, the worse of the two, and the one of which she rid herself first, consisted of those who advised her not to take so much care of herself, and preached, even if only negatively, 
and with no outward signs beyond an occasional disapproving silence or doubting smile. The subversive doctrine that a sharp walk in the sun and a good red beefsteak would do her more good, her, who had had two dreadful sips of fishy water on her stomach for fourteen hours, than all her medicine bottles and her bed. The other category was composed of people who appeared to believe that she was more seriously ill than she thought, in fact, that she was as seriously ill as she said, and so none of those whom she had allowed upstairs to her room, after considerable hesitation and at Francoise's urgent request, and who in the course of their visit had shown how unworthy they were of the honour which had been done them by venturing a timid, don't you think that if you were just to stir out a little on really fine days? Or who, on the other hand, when she said to them, I am very low, very low, nearing the end, dear friends, had replied, Ah, yes, when one has no strength left. Still, you may last a while yet. Each party alike might be certain that her doors would never open to them again. And if Françoise was amused by the look of consternation on my aunt's face whenever she saw, from her bed, any of these people in the Rue du Saint-Esprit, who looked as if they were coming to see her, or heard her own doorbell ring, she would laugh far more heartily, as at a clever trick, at my aunt's devices, which never failed, for having them sent away, and at their look of discomfiture when they had to turn back without having seen her and would be filled with secret admiration for her mistress, whom she felt to be superior to all these other people, inasmuch as she could, and did contrive not to see them. In short, my aunt stipulated, at one and the same time, that whoever came to see her must approve of her way of life, commiserate with her in her sufferings, and assure her of an ultimate recovery. In all this, Eulalie excelled. My aunt might say to her twenty times in a minute, The end is come at last, my poor Eulalie. Twenty times Eulalie would retort with, Knowing your illness as you do, Madame Octave, you will live to be a hundred, as Madame Sazeran said to me only yesterday. For one of Eulalie's most rooted beliefs and one that the formidable list of corrections which her experience must have compiled was powerless to eradicate, was that Madame Sazerat's name was really Madame Sazeran. I do not ask to live to a hundred, my aunt would say, for she preferred to have no definite limit fixed to the number of her days. And since, besides this, Eulalie knew as no one else knew how to distract my aunt without tiring her. Her visits, which took place regularly every Sunday, unless something unforeseen occurred to prevent them, were for my aunt a pleasure the prospect of which kept her on those days in a state of expectation, appetizing enough to begin with, but at once changing to the agony of a hunger too long unsatisfied, if Eulalie were a minute late in coming. For, if unduly prolonged, the rapture of waiting for Eulalie became a torture, and my aunt would never cease from looking at the time, and yawning, and complaining of each of her symptoms in turn. Eulalie's ring, if it sounded from the front door at the very end of the day, when she was no longer expecting it, would almost make her ill. For the fact was that on Sundays she thought of nothing else than this visit, and the moment that our luncheon was ended, Françoise would become impatient for us to leave the dining-room, so that she might go upstairs to occupy my aunt. But, and this more than ever from the day on which fine weather definitely set in at Combray, the proud hour of noon, descending from the steeple of Saint-Hilaire, which it blazoned for a moment with the twelve points of its sonorous crown, would long have echoed about our table beside the holy bread, which too had come in, after church, in its familiar way, and we would still be found seated in front of our Arabian night's plates, 
weighed down by the heat of the day, and even more by our heavy meal. For upon the permanent foundation of eggs, cutlets, potatoes, preserves and biscuits, whose appearance on the table she no longer announced to us, Françoise would add, as the labour of fields and orchards, the harvest of the tides, the luck of the markets, the kindness of neighbours, and her own genius might provide. And so effectively that our bill of fare, like the catrefoils that were carved on the porches of cathedrals in the thirteenth century, reflected to some extent the march of the seasons and the incidents of human life. A brill, because the fishwoman had guaranteed its freshness. A turkey, because she had seen a beauty in the market at roussainville le pan Cardoons with marrow, because she had never done them for us in that way before. A roast leg of mutton, because the fresh air made one hungry, and there would be plenty of time for it to settle down in the seven hours before dinner. Spinach, by way of a change. Apricots, because they were still hard to get. Gooseberries, because in another fortnight there would be none left. Raspberries, which Monsieur Swann had bought specially. Cherries, the first to come from the cherry tree, which had yielded none for the last two years. A cream cheese, of which in those days I was extremely fond. An almond cake, because she had ordered one the evening before. A fancy loaf, because it was our turn to offer the holy bread. And when all these had been eaten, a work composed expressly for ourselves, but dedicated more particularly to my father, who had a fondness for such things, a cream of chocolate, inspired in the mind, created by the hand of Françoise, would be laid before us, light and fleeting as an occasional piece of music, into which she had poured the whole of her talent. Any one who refused to partake of it, saying, No, thank you, I have finished, I am not hungry, would at once have been lowered to the level of the Philistines who, when an artist makes them a present of one of his works, examine its weight and material, whereas what is of value is the creator's intention and his signature. To have left even the tiniest morsel in the dish would have shown as much discourtesy as to rise and leave a concert hall while the piece was still being played and under the composer's very eyes. At length, my mother would say to me, Now, don't stay here all day. You can go up to your room if you are too hot outside, but get a little fresh air first. Don't start reading immediately after your food. And I would go and sit down beside the pump and its trough, ornamented here and there like a Gothic font with a salamander, which modelled upon a background of crumbling stone the quick relief of its slender, allegorical body. On the bench without a back, in the shade of a lilac tree, in that little corner of the garden which communicated, by a service door, with the Rue du Saint-Esprit, and from whose neglected soil rose, in two stages, an outcrop from the house itself, and apparently a separate building, my aunt's back kitchen, one could see its red-tiled floor gleaming like porphyry. It seemed not so much the cave of Françoise as a little temple of Venus. It would be overflowing with the offerings of the milkman, the fruiterer, the greengrocer, come sometimes from distant villages to dedicate here the first fruits of their fields. And its roof was always surmounted by the cooing of a dove. In earlier days... I would not have lingered in the sacred grove which surrounded this temple, for, before going upstairs to read, I would steal into the little sitting-room which my uncle Adolf, a brother of my grandfather and an old soldier who had retired from the service as a major, used to occupy on the ground floor, a room which, even when its opened windows let in the heat, if not actually the rays of the sun which seldom penetrated so far, would never fail to emit that vague and yet fresh odour, suggesting at once an open air and an old-fashioned kind of existence, which sets and keeps the nostrils dreaming when one goes into a disused gun-room. 
but for some years now I had not gone into my uncle Adolf's room, since he no longer came to Combray on account of a quarrel which had risen between him and my family, by my fault, and in the following circumstances. Once or twice every month, in Paris, I used to be sent to pay him a visit, as he was finishing his luncheon, wearing a plain alpaca coat, and waited upon by his servant in a working jacket of striped linen, purple and white. He would complain that I had not been to see him for a long time, that he was being neglected. He would offer me a march pane or a tangerine, and we would cross a room in which no one ever sat, whose fire was never lighted, whose walls were picked out with gilded mouldings its ceiling painted blue in imitation of the sky, and its furniture upholstered in satin, as at my grandparents, only yellow. Then we would enter what he called his study, a room whose walls were hung with prints which showed, against a dark background, a plump and rosy goddess, driving a car, or standing upon a globe, or wearing a star on her brow. Pictures which were popular under the Second Empire, because there was thought to be something about them that suggested Pompeii, which were then generally despised, and which now people are beginning to collect again for one single and consistent reason, despite any others which they may advance, namely, that they suggest the Second Empire. And there I would stay with my uncle until his man came, with a message from the coachman, to ask him at what time he would like the carriage, my uncle would then be lost in meditation while his astonished servant stood there, not daring to disturb him by the least movement, wondering and waiting for his answer, which never varied. For in the end, after a supreme crisis of hesitation, my uncle would utter, infallibly, the words, A quarter past two, which the servant would echo with amazement, but without disputing them. A quarter past two. Very good, sir. I will go and tell him. At this date, I was a lover of the theatre, a platonic lover of necessity, since my parents had not yet allowed me to enter one, and so incorrect was the picture I drew for myself of the pleasures to be enjoyed there, that I almost believed that each of the spectators looked, as into a stereoscope, upon a stage and scenery which existed for himself alone though closely resembling the thousand other spectacles presented to the rest of the audience individually. Every morning I would hasten to the Morris column to see what new plays it announced. Nothing could be more disinterested or happier than the dreams with which these announcements filled my mind, dreams which took their form from the inevitable associations of the words forming the title of the play, and also from the colour of the bills, still damp, and wrinkled with paste, on which those words stood out. Nothing, unless it were such strange titles as The Testament de César Girodot, or E. de Broy, inscribed not on the green bills of the Opera Comique, but on the wine-coloured bills of the Comédie Française. Nothing seemed to me to differ more profoundly from the sparkling white plume of the Diamant de la Caronne than the sleek, mysterious satin of the Domino Noir, and since my parents had told me that, for my first visit to the theatre, I should have to choose between these two pieces, I would study exhaustively, and in turn the title of one and the title of the other, for those were all that I knew of either, attempting to snatch from each a foretaste of the pleasure which it offered me, and to compare this pleasure with that latent in the other title until in the end I had shown myself such vivid, such compelling pictures of, on the one hand, a play of dazzling arrogance, and on the other, a gentle, velvety play, that I was as little capable of deciding which play I should prefer to see, as if, at the dinner-table, they had obliged me to choose between Rhys à l'Imperatrice and the famous cream of chocolate. All my conversations with my playfellows bore upon actors, whose art, although as yet I had no experience of it, was the first of all its numberless forms in which art itself allowed me to anticipate its enjoyment.
between one actor's tricks of intonation and inflection and another's, the most trifling differences would strike me as being of an incalculable importance. And from what I have been told of them, I would arrange them in the order of their talent, in lists which I used to murmur to myself all day long, lists which in the end became petrified in my brain, and were a source of annoyance to it, being irremovable. And later, in my school days, whenever I ventured in class, when the master's head was turned, to communicate with some new friend, I would always begin by asking him whether he had begun yet to go to theatres, and if he agreed that our greatest actor was undoubtedly Go, our second Delaunay, and so on, and if, in his judgment, Fevre came below Theron, or Delaunay below Coquelin, the sudden volatility which the name of Coquelin, forsaking its stony rigidity, would engender in my mind, in which it moved upwards to the second place, the rich vitality with which the name of Delaunay would suddenly be furnished, to enable it to slip down to fourth, would stimulate and fertilise my brain with a sense of budding and blossoming life. But if the thought of actors weighed so upon me, if the sight of Morbant coming out one afternoon from the Théâtre Francais had plunged me in the throes and sufferings of hopeless love, how much more did the name of a star, blazing outside the doors of a theatre, how much more, seen through the window of a brougham which passed me in the street, the hair over her forehead, a bloom with roses, did the face of a woman who, I would think, was perhaps an actress, leave with me a lasting disturbance, a futile and painful effort to form a picture of her private life. I classified, in order of talent, the most distinguished. Sarah Bernhardt, Berma, Batet, Madeleine Brohan, Jeanne Samary. But I was interested in them all. Now my uncle knew many of them personally, and also ladies of another class, not clearly distinguished from actresses in my mind. He used to entertain them at his house. And if we went to see him on certain days only, that was because, on the other days, ladies might come whom his family could not very well have met. So we at least thought. As for my uncle, his fatal readiness to pay pretty widows, who had perhaps never been married, and countesses, whose high-sounding titles were probably no more than nom de guerre, the compliment of presenting them to my grandmother, or even of presenting to them some of our family jewels, had already embroiled him more than once with my grandfather. Often, if the name of some actress were mentioned in conversation, I would hear my father say, with a smile to my mother, one of your uncle's friends, and I would think of the weary novitiate through which, perhaps for years on end, a grown man even a man of real importance might have to pass, waiting on the doorstep of some such lady, while she refused to answer his letters, and made her hall porter drive him away, and imagine that my uncle was able to dispense a little jackanapes like myself from all these sufferings by introducing me in his own home to the actress, unapproachable by all the world, but for him an intimate friend. And so, on the pretext that some lesson, the hour of which had been altered, now came at such an awkward time that it had already more than once prevented me, and would continue to prevent me, from seeing my uncle. One day, not one of the days which he set apart for our visits, I took advantage of the fact that my parents had had luncheon earlier than usual. I slipped out, and, instead of going to read the playbills on their column, for which purpose I was allowed to go out unaccompanied. I ran all the way to his house. I noticed before his door a carriage and pair, with red carnations on the horse's blinkers, and in the coachman's buttonhole. As I climbed the staircase I could hear laughter, and a woman's voice, and, as soon as I had rung, silence, and the sound of shutting doors. The man-servant who let me in, appeared embarrassed, 
and said that my uncle was extremely busy and probably could not see me. He went in, however, to announce my arrival, and the same voice I had heard before said, Oh, yes, do let him come in, just for a moment. It will be so amusing. Is that his photograph there on your desk? And his mother, niece, isn't she, beside it? The image of her, isn't he? I should so like to see the little chap, just for a second. I could hear my uncle grumbling and growing angry. Finally, the manservant told me to come in. On the table was the same plate of march panes that was always there. My uncle wore the same alpaca coat as on other days, but opposite to him, in a pink silk dress with a great necklace of pearls about her throat, sat a young woman who was just finishing a tangerine. My uncertainty whether I ought to address her as Madame or Mademoiselle made me blush, and not daring to look too much in her direction, in case I should be obliged to speak to her, I hurried across to kiss my uncle. She looked at me and smiled. My uncle said, My nephew, without telling her my name, or telling me hers, doubtless because, since his difficulties with my grandfather, he had endeavoured as far as possible to avoid any association of his family with this other class of acquaintance. How like his mother he is, said the lady. But you have never seen my niece, except in photographs. My uncle broke in quickly with a note of anger. I beg your pardon, dear friend. I passed her on the staircase last year when you were so ill. It is true I only saw her for a moment and your staircase is rather dark, but I saw well enough to see how lovely she was. This young gentleman has her beautiful eyes, and also this, she went on, tracing a line with one finger across the lower part of her forehead. Tell me, she asked my uncle, is your niece, madame, is her name the same as yours? He takes most after his father, muttered my uncle, who was no more anxious to effect an introduction by proxy, in repeating Mamma's name aloud, than to bring the two together in the flesh. He's his father all over, and also like my poor mother. I have not met his father, dear, said the lady in pink, bowing her head slightly, and I never saw your poor mother. You'll remember it was just after your great sorrow that we got to know one another. I felt somewhat disillusioned, for this young lady— was in no way different from other pretty women whom I had seen from time to time at home, especially the daughter of one of our cousins, to whose house I went every New Year's Day, only better dressed. Otherwise my uncle's friend had the same quick and kindly glance, the same frank and friendly manner. I could find no trace in her of the theatrical appearance which I admired in photographs of actresses, nothing of the diabolical expression which would have been in keeping with the life she must lead. I had difficulty in believing that this was one of those women, and certainly I should never have believed her one of the smart ones, had I not seen the carriage and pair, the pink dress, the pearly necklace, had I not been aware, too, that my uncle knew only the very best of them. But I asked myself how the millionaire who gave her her carriage and her flat and her jewels could find any pleasure in flinging his money away upon a woman who had so simple and respectable an appearance. And yet, when I thought of what her life must be like, its immorality disturbed me more, perhaps, than if it had stood before me in some concrete and recognisable form, by its secrecy and invisibility, like the plot of a novel, the hidden truth of a scandal which had driven out of the home of her middle-class parents, and dedicated to the service of all mankind, which had brought to the flowering point of her beauty, had raised to fame or notoriety this woman, the play of whose features, the intonations of whose voice, like so many others I already knew, made me regard her, in spite of myself, as a young lady of good family, her who was no longer of a family at all. We had gone by this time into the study, and my uncle, who seemed a trifle embarrassed by my presence, offered her a cigarette. "'No, thank you, dear friend,' she said. "'You know, I only smoke the ones the Grand Duke sends me. I tell him that they make you jealous.' 
and she drew from a case cigarettes covered with inscriptions in gold, in a foreign language. "'Why, yes,' she began again suddenly. "'Of course I have met this young man's father with you. Isn't he your nephew? How on earth could I have forgotten? He was so nice, so charming to me.' She went on modestly and with feeling. But when I thought to myself what must actually have been the rude greeting, which, she made out, had been so charming, I, who knew my father's coldness and reserve, was shocked, as though at some indelicacy on his part, at the contrast between the excessive recognition bestowed on it and his never-adequate geniality. It has since struck me as one of the most touching aspects of the part played in life by these idle, painstaking women, that they devote all their generosity, all their talent, their transferable dreams of sentimental beauty, for, like all artists, they never seek to realise the value of those dreams, or to enclose them in the four-square frame of everyday life. And their gold, which counts for little, to the fashioning of a fine and precious setting for the rubbed and scratched and ill-polished lives of men. And just as this one filled the smoking-room, where my uncle was entertaining her in his alpaca coat with her charming person, her dress of pink silk, her pearls, and the refinements suggested by intimacy with the Grand Duke, so, in the same way, she had taken some casual remark by my father, had worked it up delicately, given it a turn, a precious title, set in it the gem of a glance from her own eyes, a gem of the first water. Blended of humility and gratitude, and so had given it back, transformed into a jewel, a work of art, into something altogether charming. Look here, my boy, it is time you went away said my uncle. End of section 6